I'm speaking today from Paul's uh, letter to the Ephesians and chapter 4. They say it's easy to be a Christian on your own. It's just when other people come along that the trouble starts. As soon as Jesus had been baptised, he chose 12 disciples to travel with him. And what a bunch. Several brawny fishermen, a dreamer and an academic, a tax collector, a zealot. That's a terrorist, really. That's when the fun started. But the thing is, holiness is not some mystical quality of our relationship to God, a personal and private spirituality. You cannot measure goodness in a vacuum, but only in the real world of people, broken people like you and I. Holiness is forged in community. Having spoken at length about the unity of the body of Christ, the way Jesus came to unite Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, into one body, called to be God's new creation here on the earth. Here, in today's reading, Paul moves from doctrine to practice with that tiny conjunction, therefore. Therefore, each of you must put off selfhood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In other words, this is where the rubber hits the road, the nitty-gritty of living as a church family, not as church-goers or attenders of a religious club, but members of the same body. In this part of the letter, Paul gives five concrete areas for the Ephesians to work on, and they all concern relationships. Relationships matter to God, and they matter to the world, because they communicate his nature as a loving community of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So, today's message is very practical. First point, truth-telling. We must tell one another the truth because falsehood undermines fellowship. Why? Trust is built on truth. There is one letter difference between those two words. If someone lies to us, we cannot trust them. Sometimes this means telling people the truth when they've hurt us but gently, in love. Don't ignore hurts. They just grow and fester. We need to be able to trust one another so we tell each other the truth, however difficult. The second point Paul makes is about controlling our anger. Don't, let, don't sin by letting anger control you. Or, in another version or translation, be angry but don't sin. We sometimes think as Christians we should not get angry at all. This is a real issue because aspects of human behaviour should anger us as they anger God. Poverty, injustice, people trafficking, bullying... Look at Jesus' anger in the temple where money changers were exploiting the poor and taking over the only part of the temple where Gentile pilgrims could come for prayer. The issue here, says Paul, is are we in control of our anger or is it in control of us? When we encounter evil in the world, we should be indignant and not tolerate everything. We should be angry and not apathetic, but we must censor our anger because we are fallen. Take a rain check. Does this anger come from hurt pride, resentment, or a desire for revenge? Are we brooding over something so our thoughts go into that downward spiral 
Remember, this passage is specifically about living in community where feelings are easily hurt. James writes too, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Point two, control our anger. Point three, honesty at work. Don't steal, said Paul, either openly or by avoiding taxes or encouraging others to do so. Employers don't underpay or exploit your workers. Employees don't slack, do an honest day's work so you can earn and contribute to those in need in the community. Notice the reasoning that Paul gives for an honest day's work, so that we can know the joy of giving. Winston Churchill famously said, We make a living by what we earn. We make a life by what we give. So number one, speak truthfully. Number two, control our anger. Number three, practice honesty. Number four, practice kindness of speech. And here I could add of text or tweet or email. Don't use your mouth for all words for evil, but for good. Now the word Paul uses for evil here is sapros, which literally means rotten or decaying. Our words can cause harm so that a rot sets in to the hearer's heart. Think, for example, of teenagers who need healing from rash words spoken over them in anger or hurtful texts or Facebook posts. They are then buried deep within our soul where they fester like a sort of rot. There's never been an untruer word than that playground expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Jesus spoke very seriously about the power of speech in Matthew 12. He said this, But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. But on a positive front, Paul says that words can be used to build up, to impart healing and grace, to comfort and encourage others. So let us use words and texts and Facebook posts carefully. There is no place in community for clamour, raised voices or slander. Slander is gossip, talking about others behind their backs. Don't tell other people what someone else has done or how much they've annoyed you. That's like the grumbling of the crowd in today's gospel reading. Measure your words. And finally, and probably most importantly, or fifthly, forgiveness. Forgiveness is the partner of kindness. Because we are all human and broken, we will hurt each other sometimes. We will get angry. We will say things we regret. We need to be able to give and to receive forgiveness. This requires humility, the ability to recognise our own and others' brokenness. It is not a statement that the hurt did not matter, but that we have chosen to forgive. And the reason? Because God, in Christ, freely forgave us everything. Forgiveness is a journey, 
and we need to pray daily for help. That's why Jesus put it in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Maybe he knew how much we, we would struggle and yet how critical it is for Christian community. So let's recap. Number one, be truthful, even if that is difficult. Number two, control our anger. Number three, be honest at work. Number four, practice kindness of speech. Measure your words. And number five, be forgiving of each other. How do you measure up? What do you struggle with? Take a moment's quiet to be honest with yourself and with God. And afterwards, I will read a few verses from Peter's second letter. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. So help us, Lord. Amen.